may be seated. The text we just read, and we're going to get back to it in a minute. Since God is seeking worshipers, and that's what the text says there, He is seeking worshipers. Since God is seeking worshipers, if you're a lover of God and a follower of Christ, then worship ought to be, in fact, if we take the text here, must be, he said they must worship in spirit and truth, worship must be a priority for you. Now let's talk about worship for a minute so we make sure we're talking about the same thing. How, there's a lot of definitions out there, a lot of good definitions for worship. I'm going to just offer you one. Uh, to, to worship is to ascribe uh, reverence, adoration, glory, honor to an infinitely superior being, in this case, namely God. Worship is ascri- ascribing greatness, goodness, mercy, uh, glory, honor, reverence to an infinitely superior being, namely God. Worship is love. Christian worship is love responding to love. God has loved us and we're loving him back. The Westminster Shorter Catechism gets the chief end of man right. It says the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Glory if you were to define it, glory is one of those nebulous kind of terms that aren't easy to, is not easy to define, whether you look at the Old Testament or you look at the New Testament. But glory means carries the notion of weight, of heaviness, of significance, of value, of worth. So to glorify God means to ascribe to Him significance and value. And again, honor, Bible says. Whether you're eating or drinking, in all that you do, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, in all that you do, glorify God. I would take to worship God and to glorify God as almost synonymous. If I wanted to get into one of my hair-splitting times, I might be able to divide that a little bit. But generally, for our purposes, when we talk about glorifying God or we talk about worshiping God, we're talking about the same thing. We're talking about uh, ascribing value, worth, honor, reverence to God. It is very true that worship in its broadest, most comprehensive uh, connotation involves all of life, everything that you do. Your talking, your thinking, your attitudes, your action, the, the way you do your job, whatever your vocation is, the way you do your family, the way you act and behave in the neighbor. It's all expressions of worship. It's all a way to worship. It's a way of uh, ascribing to God and reflecting who God is. Now, as I talk about worship this morning, I'm going to link it more closely, not exclusively, but more closely to what we do in our personal devotional time and what we do when we gather together as a Christian community, even like today, where we sing songs, we play music, we pray, we share God's Word, we fellowship together. So I'm going to take a little bit narrower with worship. And I'm not going to make, and there are distinctions, I'm not going to make distinctions between praise and worship. You can go to a worship seminar for that. But praise generally is, can be what we say to God or what we say to others about God. So we can sing a song about God where we're actually just sort of encouraging one another about God. So, and, and thanksgiving, when it's verbalized, really becomes praise is usually in, it has to do with his, uh, you know, what he's done, his deeds. Now, having said all that, since I am talking about worship and devotional capacity or when we gather together, the word most often used for worship in the New Testament, a uh, Greek word is proskuneo. And uh, proskuneo really means to bend towards, to lean towards. Some worship people have made more of it than they need to. Pros is a preposition. It means to and towards. Kaneo means kiss. So some worship leaders have got into some real, and they're not wrong, but they go a little bit too far. The word really doesn't exactly mean that. They will say, okay, when you worship, that means to lean forward and kiss, like the idea of kissing God. It's really not. 
Uh, proskuneo does carry the idea of a certain intimacy, uh, veneration even, bowing, prostrating yourself. And where kiss comes in would be kissing another's feet, a superior's feet. So, so you got to get out of your idea because what's happened, I think, a lot in contemporary worship is this kind of like male, female kind of, you know, no, no, no. This, this is... This, yeah, you, you, so, okay, so, so you guys, you guys are okay then with me. Like, I, 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 when I worship God, I can't get that picture in my mind and be able to worship. Now, I can ba- see myself on my knees, on my face before God, kissing his feet. So anyhow, we'll talk about worship. So the scripture says here, let's look at it again. Let me get back here. Gospel of John chapter 4. In fact, let me just start in the beginning just for a minute. John chapter 4, very beginning. Uh, the scripture says that, uh, let's see when we pick it up. Let's just pick up in verse 4. Speaking about Jesus, it says he had, he had to pass through Samaria. John 4, 4. He had to pass through Samaria. It's an interesting expression there because he could have gone around Samaria. He wasn't forced by some kind of external sort of compulsion and said, there is no other way to go. There's mountains on this side, water on the and I have to go here. It says he had to go through Samaria. See, typically, a good Jew doesn't want anything to do with the Samaritan. There were long-standing differences there. I mean, the Samaritan neighborhood was a neighborhood you wanted to avoid. You ever, when you're growing up, your parents ever tell you, don't go in that neighborhood? Oh, none of you did. My parents did. I mean, there were certain neighborhoods you just didn't go in for various reasons, but they just didn't think it would be a good neighborhood for you to go in. Well, this wasn't a good neighborhood for Jesus to go in, but it says he had to go to Samaria. See, see God had a plan, and Jesus was executing that plan. And he had to go to Samaria because there was a Samaritan woman there that was in trouble. There was a Samaritan woman in there that really was, was having some trouble with her life. There was a Samaritan woman there that God intended for Jesus to meet up with, and that was going to be her day of salvation. Had to, to, to go. You know, maybe uh, well, Skylar and Darcy over here, maybe, maybe there was some, you, you had to come to Maple Shade. Hey, you say, what am I going to go there for? Well, you might not even know. You say, oh, it's a job. It's this, it's that. Well, usually God has bigger things in mind than that. So if we were kind of writing their story, Scholar and Darcy had to leave Utah and come to Maple Shade. But the story's not finished yet, so we don't know why altogether. But that's it. It says he had to go. Sometimes, I'll tell you what, you're following Jesus, sometimes he's going to take you places you never planned to go. Sometimes you're going to, you're going to go places and you're going to find, you know, somehow, some way, you're like, I had to go there. I had to talk to that person. I couldn't, you know, when I, when I drive and travel sometimes, you, you know, you can come to the cities and you can go around. You know, the loops, I'm always looping the cities because I, I don't want to go. Even I got to spend extra miles there. I, I don't want to go. But sometimes there's places and sometimes there's cities. It's going to you got to go. There, so this is Jesus. So he goes there, he meets a Samaritan woman, and this Samaritan woman, I get, a lot of you guys know the story. Jesus is talking to her, and that was unusual, I mean, for a man to talk to a woman, and a Jewish man to talk to a Samaritan woman. I mean, this was unheard of. And again, longstanding, both religious and, and really even ethnic racial differences between the Samaritans and the Jews. So they're having this conversation. And then in verse 16, Jesus says to her, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you're right in saying I have no husband. See, that's what is always interesting about this, because Jesus is the one to ask the question, go call your husband and come here. The woman says, I have no husband. He says, you're right. And it's like, well, why'd you ask me that then? So Jesus isn't asking a question because he doesn't know. He's asking a question because he wants something to be born. He wants but something from her, 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 her heart. It said, you're right in saying, I have no husband, for you had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you said is true. And the woman said, this is a brilliant observation, right? The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. I mean, if you were talking to someone and they just told you something about your life that they had no way of knowing, and it was very precise and all of that, yeah, I perceive that you're a prophet. This, this, This woman here, just the mere fact that she was a female gave her low status in the community, the fact that she had been through whatever these relationships were and broken relationships, different people have different observations about that, but she wasn't in a, in a, in a good place. And Jesus is talking to... See, you know what? Jesus is always... 
I mean, you, boy, we got to kind of get this. I mean, G, Jesus is, you, you know, like, here's the way it goes. When I, when I was a kid, I always liked sports. I still like sports. And, and sometimes, you know, we might go to basketball court or we go wherever we're going. We, we're always looking to play games. And what you're doing before a game, because they're just pickup games, you're, you're looking to see who can play. <laughs> You're looking who's tall, like at least basketball. I mean, there were short guys that could really, really play. But you're looking, you're looking for big guys, and you're looking for guys that can play. Because when it comes time to choose up the team, say, I'll take him, I'll take him. You know, Jesus, God doesn't work that way. And, you know, there'll always be somebody that'd be left, and you know how it is. And I guess that whole generation is just ruined because they got picked last. But you know what I found? You, you know what I found? I mean, this is the truth. I, I, I'll say it like the kids that got picked last, most of them knew they, they should be picked last. They didn't have any illusions about themselves. They really didn't. And for some of them, it became a motivation to get better. That's just a little social commentary on the side. And some of them, it probably did hurt. But you know what? God is not like that at all. What, 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 here would be, you know, he wouldn't do that. But if Jesus coming to basketball court, he's like... Uh, no offense to anybody, but, you know, he, uh, Chubby will use. Uh, that chubby slow guy, I want him on my team. Oh, that guy over there? 5'2"? Five, five, yeah, come here. You can play center. You, uh, yeah. What he does is he, the Bible says it right in 1 Corinthians. That, that's the kind of people he chooses. Every once in a while he chooses somebody. To, every once in a while he says, oh, that 6'10 guy over there. But most of the time he doesn't. He says, oh, this one don't have it. That guy, we're picking up baseball. That guy just struck out six times last week. Come on my team. And then what he does is he works in you and he changes you and all of a sudden you're doing things that you never could do on your own and nobody is saying, what a great player that guy is. They're saying, what a great guy. How did he ever get that out of him? So he's talking to this one. And this is who Jesus is encountering here. And this is just how he, he is. That's, that, that ought to give us all hope. You know, ought to give us all hope. And then he's, he's talking. He said, I, I perceive that you're a prophet. And then she says, our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is a place where people ought to worship. Now, there's, there's usually three different approaches to this. Some will say, some scholars will say, you know what? Uh, this woman tried to just change the conversation. It was getting too hot for her. It was getting too close for her. And she tried to change the conversation. We're going we're to divert this and we're going to go over the worship. I tend to lean that way. I would be in that camp there. Some scholars say she just wanted to demonstrate that she just wasn't some any, you know, kind of low status woman here. She wanted to up this conversation and show him, hey, you're not just dealing with anybody here. I, I know my stuff. I know my theology. I know my re religion. And others, uh, in fact, the majority of scholars, at least that I've read, would say, well, she genuinely, genuinely wanted to engage in this conversation. She wanted an answer to it. I'm not sure what the answer is. It just happened, and Jesus didn't avoid it. He didn't say, hey, look, we're not talking about that. We're talking about your living situation. Now, you know what I think was going on there? In fact, what I'm pretty sure, I think at the end of the day, her problem in having had five husbands and this one and that one and whatever's going on with her, her problem at the end of the day was she was worshiping the wrong God in the wrong way. So he's going to talk to her. See, that really always, always comes out. I mean, you know, what you most value, you, you always end up worshiping. Who you most value, you end up worshiping. I mean, we could blow that up here, but I'm not, wh whoever it is. And it doesn't take long. I mean, I'm not a genius, but if I knew you well and we could look at some things, you could probably do this. You know what? Here's, hopefully it'd be God, but then we'd see the things that contend for that. We see the things that we contend for. That. So anyhow, I don't want to belabor that point. They're having this conversation, and it goes to worship. And she says, our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place. Now, in, in this, when John sets this up and Jesus is having this discussion, actually, the mountain and Jerusalem are set, or actually this way, spirit and truth, because he says worship and spirit and truth, are set in contrast to the mountain and Jerusalem. See, the mountain is uh, Gerizim, or you can pronounce it a little bit differently, but I'm going to pronounce it that way. And you'll say, well, what's that? Well, if you go all the way back to the Old Testament, Moses, shortly before he died, said, when you get into the promised land, we'll, we'll just put it this way. Here's a service that you're supposed to have. He says there's Mount uh, Ebal and Mount Gerizim. And on the one, what you need to do is you need to have people up there, and they're going to announce all the curses of the law. In other words, these bad things are going to happen if you're not following God. And then on the other mount, Mount 
Gerizim, you got to have a bunch of, you got to have the people actually, it was representatives of the tribes, and they're going to be letting you know all the blessings of o- obedience. Now, what happened is this. As Israel developed as a nation, probably uh, one, two, wait, Saul, David, Psalm. their fourth king was Rehoboam. Rehoboam did some really dumb things, and the kingdom was split. And Jeroboam took the northern kingdom, which, and then he made his headquarters. His capital city became Shechem, and he introduced false worship. And things were pretty bad there, but they got even worse. In about 722, 722 B.C., the northern kingdom got destroyed by Assyria. Actually, there was about 12 years, I think, 734 B.C. to 722, when it culminated. Assyria, a rival nation, much stronger, just devastated the northern kingdom, okay? And you got the, the mount, Mount Gerizim is there. That's the mount she's talking about. It's close to where they're at right now. And, and that's the mountain where actually what happens is the Assyrians come in there, they wipe them out, and what they do is they deport a lot of Israelites. And then what they do is they bring in a lot of people from other pagan nations. Take these out, now we've got to bring people in to replace them. So you've got all these pagan nations that then intermarry with these Israelites and produce what we would, might call another race with really false worship. And, and the Samaritans, the Samaritans only believed in the books of the law, first five books of the law. In, in fact, um, well, I think that's why Jesus says what he says later. You guys are, you know, you're ignorant. You only got a little bit of knowledge here. And what happened, actually, eventually, there was actually a, a temple that was built on that mountain. About 150 years before the time of Jesus, it was destroyed again. But the Samaritans, they had a corrupted, false, awful worship. And a debate always existed between, the, or always uh, since the time the Samaritans were kind of fully in place with that false worship, between Jews and Samaritans over where you're supposed to worship. And the Jews said, well, you worship in Jerusalem. That's where God told uh, Solomon or David to build the temple. It's in Jerusalem. And I, I'd also take a little bit further there. Not only is the idea of where's the geographical location, where's the place? Because there's a place where we're supposed to worship God. They're saying you worship on the mountain or is it in Jerusalem? But also the idea of Jerusalem, in my mind anyhow, was the temple. And the temple had certain protocols. So there were certain ways and methods and prescribed the liturgy. In other words, it was a place you worship God. God, and there was a particular way that you worship God. So she's, she's saying, okay, what's the truth? What's right? And then, then Jesus says, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. I'll tell you, there's something breaking here. A little bit further on, he says, an hour, or further down, verse 23, he says, the Father is seeking, at the end of verse 23, because I want to stay there for just a minute, it says the Father is seeking such people to worship Him, those in spirit and truth. We'll talk about spirit and truth. But I want to get here. Father is seeking worshipers. It's going to be the first thing that you really, really don't want to miss. Here's the discussion. We're talking uh, between uh, the Samaritan woman and Jesus. We're talking about the priority of worship. It opens up here in three or four. Don't you wish that preachers like myself could take, like, what did it take me to read through that? 15 seconds? All right, let's pray. You can go. <laughs> there, there it is. But no, you need to be able to open that up because we just don't, you know, we weren't there then. We didn't know what they knew then. They didn't have the background. We, we don't have the background that they did. But anyhow, the Father's seeking worshipers. When you find out, so there's not too many places in the Bible where the Scripture says this is who the Father's seeking. The Bible says at one point his eyes go to and fro throughout the whole earth seeking those whose hearts are completely his. I'll tell you, you ought to, something ought to really get you when it says the Father's seeking. This is something God's seeking. Okay, so why? Why is he seeking worshipers? Real quick, I'm going to do this quicker than I did in the early service. Real quick, number one, and you can infer this from the text. Uh, he says in here, um, let's see, he says an hour is coming and is now here. An hour is coming and is now here. What Jesus is saying, in fact, you'll see this throughout the New Testament, the future has now broken into the present. The future has broken into the present in the life, death, 
and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The future, actually, I, 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 I know what he's pointing to. He's pointing to there's going to be the, the, there's already the life, the death and the resurrection and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon all flesh. That's going to move us, it has moved us, into a new era or a new age. It's the age of the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says the Holy Spirit is a down payment on what's to come. Do you know, you probably don't realize it. I mean, you look around the world, you see how bad it is and all the trouble there is and all the conflict there is. The Bible says that we've been given the Holy Spirit and that's a down payment on what's to come. What is yet future, what is, I mean, a theologian, what, what is eschatologically true at the very end has now broken into the present in the Spirit and we get a little bit of heaven right now. Jesus says, an hour is coming and is now here because I, 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 I've arrived. So this thing is breaking. So, so why is the Father seeking worshipers? Because that's your destiny. That's your destiny. Um, you know, in, I'll just hit one Psalm, uh, Psalm 86.9. I could give you a dozen of them. I did that in the early service. But here, here's the thing, and hear this. Why is he seeking worshipers? First of all, can't infer from the text, Actually, it's clear in the text. It's because that's our destiny. This is just Psalm 86, 9. Listen, it says, All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. There are literally dozens of texts, especially through Psalms, that say something like this, that the work of the people of God, the, wor- the work that the people of God do does not terminate on mission, but mission terminates on worship. The goal of making disciples of all the nations is not just that disciples make disciples, but that disciples worship God. If you read, you'll be astounded, and it will really broaden your view of what you think is going to happen at the very end of it all. When you read through Psalms and talks again and again and again, of the nations, the nations, that's all peoples, doesn't mean every single one without exception, but it means all kinds of people throughout the world worshiping God. So as much as I love mission, and you love mission, and we all ought to love mission, and sharing the gospel, and doing all those things, it doesn't terminate on mission, it terminates on worship, the Father seeking worshipers, and that's your destiny, to worship. Now, what you can infer then, if that's your destiny, why is he seeking worship? Because that's your created purpose. Whenever you see what's supposed to take place out here in, in heaven, this is what it is. Well, you can be darn sure, excuse me for that, you can be certainly sure. I actually get criticized when I say things like that, because especially old time Pentecostals, no offense, they'll say, you know what, darn substitutes for, don't you? I'm like, you know, it wasn't even my brain. Don't even say that to me. All right? So you can be real sure. And whatever you got there, and he, he created you for that purpose. Isaiah 43, 7. He's talking, he, he talks about his people, which he's created for his glory. He's created people that would ascribe greatness to him. And that's not because God's an egomaniac, because here's the third reason. You worship God and he's seeking worshipers because he's worthy of worship. God is the greatest, we're gonna, probably not going to be, our grammar's not going to be good at this point, but you'll get the point. Uh, God is the, you know, most greatest, most perfect, strongest, wisest being in all the universe that exists, that has ever existed, that will ever exist. He is infinitely superior to every other thing, every other created thing, every other person. And when I use an adjective like infinite, it's designed to do something in your brain. It isn't like, well, he's a lot higher. When you get infinite, you, it's immeasurably higher. You can't even get your head around it. God is, here, here's the truth. God lives in your heart, but God also transcends everything that goes around. God is bigger and broader and, and, and stronger and more majestic and more beautiful than you can ever imagine. But cause God is all of those things, to worship anyone or anything other than God would be sin. So we've been 
We've been born and created to worship. We're destined to worship. God is worthy of our worship. And we could go on and on and on there. So he's seeking worshipers. But he's seeking worshipers of a particular kind. When he says he's seeking worshipers in spirit and in truth, he wants to say something very important to, in fact, I think radical to at least the people of the day, maybe not so much to us, about worship. Because he's going to, he, he say, she says, what about the mountain? What about Jerusalem? He says, Father's seeking worshipers, and they must worship in spirit and in truth. Well, what in the world is Jesus saying? Well, see, worship before was associated with a particular place and even a particular form. Jesus is saying, now, probably all your Bibles have a small s, and that's fine. That's talking about man's spirit. Uh, It seems to me, and I'll base this on, I guess, John 3, 7, where Scripture talks about being born again. See, our spirit is, is dead. You know, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. And Scripture says we have to be born again. The Holy Spirit comes in, works in us, and makes our spirit alive. And then our spirit testifies with His Spirit that we are, in fact, sons of God. So when this says you're going to worship in spirit, you know what Jesus does? He says, you know what true worship is? True worship is not linked to a a, a locality. True worship isn't linked to external stuff. True worship is going to come from inside. True worship is going to come from the heart. True worship isn't going to come necessarily with particular form. True worship is something that happens in the heart between you and God, and your heart expresses itself to God. So you could actually be, you could be in a beautiful building. You could have excellent liturgy and worship service, what we call a worship service, and not really be engaged in worship. On the other hand, man, a couple of us could get together and we could be out somewhere and we could be worshiping God with all of our heart and enjoying the presence of God. And so I don't mess it up here. You can be in a beautiful building. You can be doing beautiful and skilled liturgy and certainly engaging God in worship. See, it comes down to the heart. He says, you worship in spirit. We're going to change. Something changed when Jesus came. And the reason Pastor Jonathan talked about it a couple of weeks ago, Jesus said this. You can see it in the chapter, chapter 2, I guess, in Matthew 12, verse 6. Jesus essentially said, you know what? This old temple, this old way, all of that, it's going to be torn down, and I'm the new temple. And then he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, talking about the body of Christ, because we're linked to him. He said, you, plural, you, are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So now what happens? See, before you had to go to the temple to meet with God, before you had to go to the temple to get right with God. You want to get right with God now? You want to know God now? You want to worship God now? Well, you can do that because Christ is the new temple. The body of Christ is the new temple. And that's where we meet with God. And and, and what Jesus did, I mean, you all know it, when he died on the cross, there was that veil that separated the, the holy place from the most holy place. And he says he tore that down. Well, the bottom line is this, is God in Christ Jesus has now provided free access to the throne of grace. So if you've got to get right with God and some of you got to get right with God, you can get right with God today. You can call upon Jesus. You can say, Jesus, save me from my sins. Jesus, forgive me for my sins. Jesus, I surrender my life to you. Jesus, I turn from my sins. And you can know God. He said, this is worship in spirit. This is spirit-led, spirit-empowered, uh, spirit, spiritual worship. And you can worship God with a wide variety of expressions, or you can actually worship God quietly and everything in between. See, there's nothing like, see, see the problem is you can even come into, you know, whatever the most charismatic church you've ever been in. Everybody's jumping around and raising their hands. You know, I'm cool with that and, and that kind of worship, but that doesn't mean they're worshiping. It doesn't. You know, we can pick on the traditional church and say, ah, oh, they got the stained glass and nice buildings and liturgy and they're all of this, and, but they're not really worshiping. We have no idea, no, and it's really what's in the heart. You may or not, may not be worshiping God, but you can come into some real, you know, kind of hot, charismatic church and everybody's jumping around and doing things. They might not be worshiping God either. See, because Jesus said, that's not really what worship is. Worship comes from the heart. Now, worship gets expressed in a variety of ways, so it may or may not be an indicator. So, but he says this, too. He goes on, and I, for me, I mean, those of you that know me will know how important this is to me. He says, you must work. So, you know what? The option isn't yours. You must. You want to be a worshiper? Then you, that worship needs to be in spirit. So that means you, you don't wait till you get here Sunday morning and you get in the building. Okay, now I'm going to worship God. But then he says this. 
He says you need to worship. Um, it says you must worship in spirit and in truth. Wow. So he's seeking worshipers. Well, he's seeking wor- worshipers of a particular kind, those that will worship in spirit and those that will worship in truth. To worship in truth means that you have particular true views about God. You know, there, you, you can hold erroneous views about God and your worship is of no account because you're worshiping a God that doesn't exist. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus said, sanctify them in truth. Our word is truth. You know what? The best worship, you know, however it comes around, whether it's you personally worshiping before the Lord, whether it's in a service like we had today, whatever that is, the best worship. I'm not talking about your life out there, your vocation. I'm talking about those personal times and times when the corporate body's together, is Scripture-saturated worship. The songs that we're singing, either they're uh, conclusions from Scripture, they're summaries of Scripture, or they're actual Bible Scripture. I'll tell you what happens. Do you know that the Bible is inspired by the Holy Spirit, and we kind of just take that thing for, for granted? But here's the thing. The, the, the Bible is inspired by the Holy Spirit. The Bible teaches us in John 16, I guess it is, the primary ministry of the Holy Spirit is to glorify Christ. If you have a worship service and you sing songs that have been inspired by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will most assuredly attend that service with His presence, His manifest presence, because when, when, when you start singing the words that He inspired to glorify Christ, He's there. One of the, one of the, one of the, oh man, just the strains and stresses in the contemporary church is the way we've dislodged ourselves, or so many have dislodged themselves from the Word of God. I shared in the early service. I was at a, uh, it was a national meeting, and I had a lot of friends there. And uh, a guy was speaking from South Africa. Don't try to figure out who he is, because none of you know him. All right. And the first night we were there, I mean, it's you know, it's a conference. It's, it's real long. But he doesn't open up the Bible, and he, he keeps telling all these stories, and he's like hyping everybody. You know, you know how, like, you know when there's something real, and you know when you're getting hyped, you know, and it's hype. And we got, it was almost an hour, and it finally opened the, the scripture to Exodus. So, you know, I, I probably had a bad attitude, and uh, Lord forgive me for that, but I, I said to my wife, I said, yeah, I can't believe this. I said, we've been here an hour. I said, you've been doing all this stuff. I said, you just opened up the Bible. So when we finished that meeting that night, some of you heard this story before. I said to her, I said, okay, I'm coming back here tomorrow. I actually did this. Uh, God forgive me if I'm wrong. I said, uh, I gave him an hour. I said to her, I said, I'm going to give him one hour. I said, that Bible doesn't get open. I said, I'm getting up and I'm walking out. <laughs> and we got an hour. I hadn't opened the Bible yet. I got up and I walked out. And then I had some people that I knew that were part of the governing people over that conference and because I can't really talk to this guy directly and uh, the elders of this particular sort of mini denomination I was part of. So I wrote them all a letter. And I said, look, guys, you know, I know you're doing the best you can. I know you're in a selection process. I know all these kinds of things. And I, I said, I know you want the presence of God. I said, I know you want true worship. And I tried to do it. You know, you try, whenever you want to do something where you're trying to be kind of prophetic and corrective and humble at the same time, it's really hard to do all that. But I think they knew me well enough that they were okay. I, I said, look, this is what happened. This is what I felt about it. And I said, if you're really interested, and if we're really interested as a fellowship in having God attend our services, I said, then we need to speak from what he inspired. And then what was really, really good, I mean, I was so gratified. Sometimes you get nothing back. Uh, There's, you know, no particular religious significance here, but there were 12 elders that governed this fellowship. Six to eight of them got back to me either by phone, email, or snail mail and said, Thank you. Thank you for saying that. I felt the same way too. You are right. When you worship in truth, that's biblically informed worship. It's biblically saturated worship. So now we get to, here's a couple big words. Okay, you ready? You know what, what, they, what, they, what they teach you, this is really sad, what they teach you in like preaching classes and stuff like that, they, you, you, you guys are good. They, they tell you, well, people can't really deal with, you know, certain big words, and they can't deal with, so don't use those. I hate that. These aren't even that big of words, but I'll define them for you anyhow. Here, here it is. When you talk about worship in spirit and truth, your theology or theology, and theology has to do with the study of God, your theology must inform your doxology. 
Doxa, the Greek word for glory is doxa. Doxology really has more to do with the, the way, the practice, the liturgy, whatever you want to call it, that you employ to worship God. Guess what? True worship needs to be theologically informed. You need to know true things about God. You need to know that God's a creator. You need to know that God rules the universe. You need to know that God's sovereign. You need to know he's got it all under his control. You need to know there's nothing happens that he's like caught off guard with. You need to know there's nothing that goes on in your life that he's unaware of. You need to know that whatever happens in your life, he will turn that thing around and he will work that thing for good. You need to know that he's doing everything he can, using every avenue he can to shape you and to Christ's image your likeness. You need to know that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You need to know that God loves. You need to know that God isn't to be trivialized with. That's one of the things, too. Here's my pet peeve. Sometimes we trivialize God. Here's the thing. God's the Father, and our spirit agrees with His spirit. We cry out, Abba, Father, and we love our Father, and all that stuff. But don't ever, 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 I know some of you are going to get upset at this, don't ever, ever, ever get too casual with God. I mean, God's a father, but he rules. God's got your future in his hands. You, get no, you don't get another breath if God doesn't say it. We don't get another breath here if God doesn't say it. This world doesn't continue for another millisecond unless God says, says so. Here's the thing. When you come to God, he's a father. If you had a good dad, you loved your dad, you could say a lot of things to your dad. You had a good relationship with your dad, but you always knew he was dad. And there was always some line you'd say, you know what? I mean, every once in a while, a good dad, you know what a good dad does with their kids when they start to cross the line? He just has to give a look. I'm still your father. You're still my kid. All right. Your theology needs to inform your doxology. You need to know some things about God. Um, so, anyhow. So God's looking for worshipers. And worshipers in spirit and in truth. I'm going to just give you a... I think. I haven't been with my notes, obviously. <laughs> um, some final thoughts. I think that's where I'm at in my outline. Uh, anyhow. Oh, yeah, here. Let me just give you a, a couple final thoughts. All right, first of all, there is a wide variety of expressions of worship. Um, there's singing, musical instruments, kneeling. I mean, I went through the scripture the other day. Lifting of hands, standing, clapping, shouting, dancing, banners, uh, quiet and contemplative, prostrated before the Lord. All of those things. A wide variety. Well, what you make a mistake is, is one, if you have something that's sort of like the litmus test. If they don't do this, they don't worship. I walked into that church and only half of them had their hands up. Boy, there's a lot of non-worshippers there. Well, maybe they got an arthritic shoulder like me. Like, I got one hand up and every once in a while I feel the anointing. And <laughs> you know, other than that, I am like, here I am, God. I'm doing one arm like two. But you, you, you just got to get, and, and again, there is a lot of acceptable means and expressions of worship. When I was young, and I see Pastor Jonathan can, do it, can still do it. When I was young and all the different streams and stuff that I traveled in, there'd, uh, there'd always be some that were like dancing before the Lord. But it wasn't any kind of like, it wasn't like what you do. It was like, uh, you know, like a hop, kind of like a skip. You know. So I, didn't, I, I couldn't dance, all right? Well, I could play sports. I played football and basketball, and I knew, like, low post moves and drop steps and things like that. I said, I'm watching what they're doing. I could do that. I could do that. So w when I was young, and I can't say I got boots on now. That was probably playing. I, I, I used to do this little, like, you know, it was, like, this way, and then I had this, like, four thing I did. You know, I went here, I went here, I hopped back there, went over there, came up here. That was when I was young. And one time we were in a worship service. We were actually at a conference. I still remember. My wife looks over at me because, you know, sometimes the heart was really full. It was just an acceptable expression uh, of worship. And she said to me, she said, you dance like a clod. <laughs> she used that word, clod. Who uses that word? Who even says that kind of a thing? <laughs> you know, and inside I'm thinking, well, I'm not dancing for you. And then, you know, as time went on, the, the, uh, I always called it like the pogo, the, and they still do it today. Like the younger ones, they were just the straight up and down jump. But now I got no, I got like no, I can't even elevate anymore. You know, <laughs> like it's really hard. A basketball could get a running start. And a, wow, what do you got? I got a six-inch vertical, baby. <laughs> and that's if I really push it. Anyhow, there's, <laughs> why did I even say that? There's, there's a, a lot of legitimate expressions 
acceptable of worship. Know this, worship flows from us to God. It's focused on God. I want to say something in a minute, but you got to get this. When, when you come into a worship service and you leave the worship service and you say, that worship didn't do anything for me, you just really missed it big time. Because if worship comes from the heart, you ought to be able to come in here and, man, maybe the songs weren't too cool. Maybe the babies were loud. Maybe this was going on, but I worship God. I found as I've gotten older, I can actually do that. I had trouble doing that when I was younger. And I said things like that, oh, man, man, worship didn't really minister to me. Man, I wish somebody would have said to me, like, you know what? It's not designed to minister to you. Could have been one of those God experiences. What did that guy say? God said, shut up. (laughs) Shut up. This is not about you. The fact that worship flows from us to God and is focused on God does not negate the fact this in our motive for it, but that when we worship God, God changes us. God will transform our thinking. Amen. He will change our attitudes. And sometimes he will do a great work of deliverance in spiritual warfare. Psalm 73, you read that, the psalmist is really depressed. And the psalmist is looking around, like some of you look around and start looking at people in the world. They're not Christian. Man, look how good they're doing. Look how their business is prospering. He uses words like fat. Look how fat they are, which was another way of saying, man, they're really doing well. Look at the houses they got. Look at the pensions they got. Look at what they got. They seem like they're healthier than us. And they're going on and on and on. You ever get, I, I, you know, I don't really get that way frequently, hardly ever, almost never. But uh, mo- Christians tend to sometimes get that way, and they're looking at everything else. And then it says around 15 or 16, it says something like this. It says, then I came to the sanctuary of the Lord. And then he says, then I came to the sanctuary of the Lord, and I perceived their end. You know what he did? All of a sudden, I came to the sanctuary of the Lord. I began to worship with my fellow believers. I began to look to God, and I began to see who God is and what God has done and what the destiny is of those who don't believe God. They might be fat in this life, but they're going to burn for all eternity if they don't turn. Well, was that too graphic? And he said, when he said he perceived their end, that's what he was perceiving. They say, they might have it now, but they're not going to have it then unless they get right now. And then, oh, uh, I mean, Acts 16, Paul and Silas doing the will of God. I mean, he just cast out a demon, you know. And, man, there's some cool things that are happening. And Paul's anointed and Silas is anointed. And what do they do? They get arrested and they get beat up. I know. You know, I know how you would have been because you've probably been a bit like me. And then you get thrown into jail. And then you're in these stocks. And then you're, man, I'm, how about that? You know, I'm doing the will of God. I thought, you know. I thought I was supposed to be blessed. I thought I was supposed to have it. Uh, You know, what is this? How this bad thing? How do I end up in jail? I'm doing the will of God. You know, I don't don't know how this thing works. Somebody at midnight, beat up, worn out. Somebody said, I think it was Paul, but it could have been Silas. Somebody said, it is time. You know, we're beat up and we're in prison and all our freedom is taken from us. It sounds like now is a time to worship. And I don't think he was worshiping to get anything from it. He was giving worship to God. So wherever you find yourself, whatever's going on, whatever you have, whatever you don't have, you worship God. Now, God decided. Now, you know, you've probably heard this before. God is receiving that worship, and they're worshiping God. Like somebody once said, God was up there in heaven, and he started tapping his foot. And when he started tapping his foot, it shook the world. (laughs) That preached well, Jonathan. (laughs) Second Chronicles 20, there's Jehoshaphat, man. There's at least three armies or maybe more. They're poised against him. He has not a chance there. And then, and, and what happens? I mean, real, in short, what happens? Uh, a guy gets a word from the Lord. A prophet speaks up. But here's the word. Uh, God says to him, says, um, battle's not yours. It's mine. You know, the Bible says fight the good fight of faith. And there's a lot of things that we're like kind of, God's in us and we're working together and things like that. Well, God says something there. He said, uh, this fight here? I mean, I would love this. Man, if I ever, ah, you know, these enemies are going to kill you. You don't have a chance. Don't worry. This battle's not yours. Oh, guess what? How about that? This battle's not yours. You know, whatever it is you're going through. Well, I'll tell you, sometimes God says this battle is not yours. He said, this is mine. And here's the thing about God. I said in early service, he's undefeated. He never got beat. (laughs) And it's not even close. But what did he do? He said, "Here's here's the only thing I want you to do. He said, next day, get the worship band together and you go out there and worship. And they went out. 
See, I don't know how that would have been if I were part of that worship. Uh, you know, he wants to get us killed first. <laughs> you, you know, that's all this is. That Jehoshaphat, forget this. But, the, but they did it. And what did they do? They collected the spoils. So one last thought, and then Tim's going to come up, and he's going to uh, lead. Oh, you know, too, just the idea of worship, um, you know, the benefits or the things that change us. Uh, psalm 115, another psalm also, basically says this. You become like what you worship. So um, you worship God, you become like Jesus. So that just might be it. I asked Tim the other day. I caught him off guard. I said, tell me, what's the point of worship? So he's like, oh, I wish I had some time to think about this. But this is what he said. He said, the point of worship is to glorify God. And then he said this, and to make him look great. Now, I want to say something about that. Here's the thing. You can never glorify it. You can never make God more glorious than he is. You can never make him less glorious than he is. You can never make him look. You can never make him greater than he is. You can never make him less great than he is. But what you can do by your worship is the greatness that's God and the glory that's God. You can worship him in a way that lets that be seen. Particularly apply this to your life. Or you can worship in a way that obscures his glory that makes it hard to see his glory. You don't really, we, we talk, we're going to glorify God. We're going to make God great in, in, in our eyes. That's probably correct to say great in our eyes. But you never make him greater. You never make him more glorious. What you do is if you worship properly, you help yourself and everybody else to see how glorious God already is. But if you, if you participate in just deficient, not biblically informed worship, or maybe you're just a miserable Christian, you obscure, obscure the glory of God. So, Tim, you come on up. On up. Hey, we're actually doing a song. We did it, uh, Yes, Lord. Now, it's, it's easy to sing that song, see, Mindless. I hope we move beyond that, and now we say this from our heart. When you're saying yes to the Lord, you're saying yes to his rule. You're saying yes to his way. You're saying yes, whatever he has for you. You know, and I know there's some things that God's spoken to you, and you've been kind of fighting it. Now, when you go to sing this song, you can't skip, Yes, Lord. When you say yes, Lord, you're saying yes to whatever it is he's given you to do. So Tim's going to lead us in this, and he's going to close us with, with this. Amen. Let's stand and sing one more time together. Thank you, Lord. We worship you, God. There's no one like you, Lord. We praise you, God. I'll just say. Just say yes, you lead the way. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid of what it means for me to say. That this life, this life you gave is not my own. Is not my own. Oh, I'm trusting you to hear my yes and lead me on.
poured out. I lavish my love on you. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Oh, God. I lavish my love on you. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Oh, if you love them, pour it out. Say, I Praise, give him honor, give him glory. Oh Lord, we we commit ourselves to you again, right here, right now. Would you take a hold of our hearts? God, would you take hold of our minds? God, would you help us to surrender everything? And God, throughout the week and when we meet on Sunday, would we give you a praise? And we would we give you worship that is fitting? The King of the world, the King of kings and Lord of lords. God, we love you. We need you. We bless your name. Would you have your way in our lives as we go? In Jesus' name, amen. Go in peace, go in peace.